the majesty of our earth, the beauty of life. Are they the result of a natural process called evolution or the work of a divine creator? This question is at the heart of a struggle that has threatened to tear our nation apart. That's an outdated religious book. Science has shown you can't For fundamentalist Christians you can't like Ken Ham, evolution is an so evil that morality. must be fought. You can't hold up your moral hand. Well, I think it's a war. It's a, it's a real battle between worldviews. For embattled teachers in Lafayette, Indiana, evolution is a truth that must be defended. I think they think someone will come out a victor, and I don't believe that that's going to be the case. If you look at the Bible, you look For at Christian the students at Wheaton College, evolution is an idea that is hard to accept. Where is God's place if everything does have a natural cause? For all of us, the future of religion, science, and science education are at stake in the creation-evolution debate. Today, even as science continues to provide evidence supporting the theory of evolution, for millions of Americans, the most important question remains. What about God? Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to High Mill. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this ministry, for Ken Ham, and for the truth that he brings to Canton, Ohio, here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you like a brochure? Thank you. Oh, that sounds real good. Everybody, here we go. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation is true. I believe that God above created me and you. So praise his name for what he made. Give credit where it's due. I don't believe in evolution. I know creation's true. Over 140 years after Charles Darwin first seemed to challenge the creation accounts in Genesis, many conservative Christians are more committed than ever to fighting the war against evolution. Today, they have come here to the High Mill Church of the Resurrection for some basic training. I didn't crawl out of a pond or swing down from a tree. Adam is my ancestor and not a chimpanzee. God created everything in six days he was through. So the Big Bang Theory is just a dud and a million years are two. If you look at what the Bible says, if we start with the revealed Word of God and we build our thinking on the Bible, it tells us about the history of the universe from beginning to end. It says that God made everything Today, in six Today, biblical days. literalism has no more forceful an advocate than Ken Ham. Five to 10,000 people visit his website every day, and his 250 lectures each year reach over a million people, eager to hear his message that we need to look no further than the Bible to find the truth about who we are. I think it means Adam took fruit from the tree, you know. You see, people say, you have a particular interpretation of Genesis. I don't think so. I think I just read it. <laughs> and what it says is what it means. Other people interpret it and they get into trouble. That's a problem, I think. Now, I believe God created in six literal days and I believe it's important. In fact, I believe it re relates to the authority of Scripture and the Gospel. Now, people say to me, well, look, the point is, the word day can mean something other than ordinary day. And you know what? That's true. I had a pastor once who said, but the word day can mean something other than ordinary day. I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. He said, that's true, but it can also mean something other than ordinary day. And I said, that's true, but it can also mean an ordinary day. <laughs> I said, look, pastor, does the word day ever mean day? Can day mean day or doesn't day mean day? And if day does mean day, when does day mean day? Can you give me an example when day means day? The Bible says, God created the earth covered with water, the sun, moon, and stars on day four. Well, that's very different to the Big Bang. If the Big Bang's true, well, the Bible got it wrong in astronomy. The Bible says there was a global flood, but uh, today we have a lot of people saying, no, there wasn't. Well, if the Bible gets it wrong in geology, 
and the Bible says God made distinct kinds of animals and plants to reproduce after their own kind, well, today evolutionists would say no one kind of animal changed into another over millions of years, so the Bible gets it wrong in biology, then why should I trust the Bible when it talks about morality and salvation? On this foundation here of, of creation, God's Word is truth. You sin or repent of your sin, people understand. Abortion's wrong, people understand. Homosexual behavior is wrong, people understand. But on this foundation, you sinner, what are you talking about? On this foundation of evolution, man determines truth. Homosexual behavior is wrong. No, it's not. Abortion's wrong. No, it's not. You see, what has happened is that this nation has changed foundation. And so have other nations around the world. No Ken Ham is not the first defender of the faith who was challenging accepted views of science to justify a literal reading of Genesis. Back in 1925, William Jennings Bryan capped his long career as a crusader for Christian values by upholding the state of Tennessee's law banning the teaching of evolution at the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Despite a scathing attack on his creationist views, Bryan prevailed. Scopes was fined $100. Within four years, 37 anti-evolution bills had been introduced in 20 states. It had a chilling effect on the teaching of evolution and the publishers of science textbooks. For decades, Darwin seemed to be locked out of America's public schools. But then, evolution received an unexpected boost from a very unlikely source, the Soviet Union. In 1957, Americans were horrified to learn that their Cold War communist rivals had beaten the U.S. into outer space with the launch of the satellite called Sputnik. The space race was on. Scientific education became a national priority. And as long neglected science programs were revived in America's classrooms, evolution was too. Biblical literalists have been doing their best to discredit Darwin's theory ever since. I want to teach you something very special this morning. The next time somebody says millions of years ago, I want you to put your hand up and say, excuse me, in a nice way, you say, were you there? Can you remember that? Next time somebody says millions of years ago, what do you say? Boy, I couldn't hear that. Next time somebody says millions of years ago, what do you say? Were you there? And you know what, mums and dads? The world scoffs at those of us who believe in Noah's flood and Noah's ark. Why let the world scoff by putting Noah's ark, look, making it look like a fairy tale? It wasn't a fairy tale. It was a real boat, wasn't it? What happened? Fountains of the deep broke open all over the earth. Volcanoes, tidal waves. But of course, all the animals, including dinosaurs on the ark, were safe, weren't they? What happened to those that didn't go on the ark? They drowned. Then what happened? They were covered in mud. What would you expect to find? Fossils. In fact, as Buddy's saying, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And boys and girls, do you know what you find? You find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Well, there really was a worldwide flood. Just look at the stony curse. With billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth real good singing for the morning let's see if we can make the whole town hear it if you've been told all your life that the billions of dead things buried in the earth got there because of a worldwide flood the evidence for an ancient earth comes as a shock so we do see evidence of change but how that change has occurred whether it has occurred through some sort of a as Darwin would have said, some sort of a natural selection, or if it's taken place through some sort of a design, if God has been directly involved in what we see as evolution, that's a bigger question. I think it's a more troubling question for an awful lot of Christians as well. We actually have a watering hole that existed here about 33 million years ago. And, uh, Many of the animals would die in this area, leaving their carcasses behind. And that's where we see a lot of the skeletons. At the Wheaton College Science Station in the Black Hills of South Dakota, the shock of the new has started more than one student on his or her way to an understanding of evolutionary history. You said the age of the site was around 30 million years old. How did you come to that uh, age? Like, through what processes did you decide on that age and come to that conclusion? When we have um, independent ages of, say, about 30 million years for the ashes, 
And then we find fossils that represent that type of development evolution-wise across the world that, that makes sense. What do you do when the evidence is before you, you're a scientist, the evidence is before you, and you want to say, well, then this completely goes against my whole upbringing. This completely goes against everything I have known to be true thus far. Can I toss it out the window? That's a struggle I've gone through this year. Where is God? Here, you look at it and tell me. Nathan Baird is a geology major in his final year at Wheaton College in Illinois. I believe we're good to go. This quiet campus is at the eye of a storm raging over opposing views about how life developed. Wheaton, one of the top 50 schools in America, is committed to exposing its students to the discoveries of science. But as a Christian college, it is also committed to preserving their faith in the God of the Bible. Students here are part of the largest religious group in America, conservative Christians. For them, conflicts between adherence to the Christian faith and the assertions of evolutionary theory are not just political or academic, they are personal. The emotions are very real and uh, they do play into the whole picture, I think, and it's because it's about something that's to do with human beings. It's to do with our very, very souls, our very existence, and that's what makes it so important, I think. Wheaton calls itself a marketplace of ideas, but some students inevitably feel threatened as they confront ways of thinking without precedent in the world from which they came. I was definitely, definitely indoctrinated in along, along those lines of, this is, this is how Genesis 1 and 2 uh, entails a story of creation, and this is how it's got to be. And yes, evolution was portrayed as an evil, you know, it was, it was Satan's doing, and it's something that, you know, is, is the demise of the church if we, if we even listen to it. I, as a kid, I had the questions of, well, how did God create the earth? And, uh, you know, well, let's go back to Genesis 1, you know, and let's read the account. And it's, you know, God formed it. Uh, he, he separated the expanses. He, get, he created day and night. But my mind wants to know the details. It wants to know what happened. He's asked difficult questions. Nathan has asked difficult questions. But I think that that's the kind of person he is. He is not uh, willing just to take just what everybody else says or believe it because that's what everybody else believes. I think that he is really the kind of person who wants to get into the nitty gritty and wants to get real, really understand. One thing that I've realized is in with talking with my mom and stuff going home, I go home, she says, so what, are you an evolutionist now? And it's, it's, the, it's the great evil. It's the great unknown evil, though. It's not even discussed, and that's what, um, kind of perturbs me is before I came to Wheaton, one of my mom's friends said, don't let him go there. He's, that's such a liberal school. And at first, when I talked to him on the phone one time, I was a little nervous. And I think I even said to Jim something to the effect that I hope he hadn't, hasn't lost his faith. Long before Wheaton students like Nathan arrive on campus, the most important lesson they have learned is that the Bible is true from the very first word. I think that the reason why our church is growing and our pastor would say the same thing is because he preaches the word of God and that's all he does. He goes uh, line upon line, verse upon verse, um, book by book. And that is the only reason why our church is growing as fast as it is. This world in which we live has convinced us that this, this life is all about our getting what we want when we want it and, and supplying all of our needs so that we can enjoy all of this life. But the Bible tells us very clearly that this life is not about you and me. This life that you and I live is all about God. Coming home is a, is a good thing for me because I get to be in much more discussion with my parents and being reminded that, you know, I'm one of four kids. I have a fiance, I have a grandma who I go over and I mow her lawn. I'm not just a person who sits and studies physical chemistry all day. And that's why, for me, it's always been good when at Wheaton um, to call home and to talk to dad and mom, or when at home to be in conversation with them. Thank you for these times you've blessed us with as a family. And we just thank you for this time, Lord, and for the beautiful day and that we could have a, 
barbecue family um, time outside this evening, Lord. We thank you for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay. Amen. Amen. Be with Melissa. And oh. be with my fiance, <laughs> Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have a little bit of steak? Yeah. I would say Christians in general, and myself included, don't know, don't know anything about evolution. So when we're bashing it or when we're tell it, just dismissing it outright, we're not even understanding what it says. And to me, to understand that God created will never change. No matter how much science discovers, God tells us, and I believe it, that man's wisdom is foolishness. To me, that tells me if, if I don't go and I don't learn, study to become a preacher, then it's foolishness. No, 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 no. no. But and I, I know you're not saying that, but, but, but when but, you but, say but, man's but, but, wisdom but, but, is foolishness, then why can't a Christian scientist come to the conclusions that evolution is true? We have to define what evolution is. I, I heard a guy say that he hold, holds wholeheartedly to the evolutionary theory um, as the best fit to its data. Um, what does he mean from that? He probably means it started with the Big Bang. Um, and, and he and, has to be wrong. And that's where I would say, no. Why can't God do the Big Bang? And why can't we can God... Agree that. We can't be on that. Right. Which day well, did he do it? What's that? Which day did he do it? I'm not, I, I'm not exactly sure this, the whole day stuff is my cup of tea. Maybe yeah. he yelled bang for because, seven days. Because, uh, and I've, what's that, he yelled Maybe bang? He yelled bang for seven days. I'm not saying science is, is worthless, but if, if, if a scientist's goal in life is to pollute, prove that Darwinism is, 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 is the way that we got here, he's gonna die a very disappointed man. The thing that I don't necessarily appreciate about the Christian community is um, the dismissal of all things of evolution as being just a natural evil. Um, yeah. And that's how I feel things are taught to students um, mm -hmm. growing up in a Christian school or a Christian church or whatever, is that at the mention of evolution, you run. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's almost ridiculous. And as a scientist, as a Christian, I would like to understand those things. And I would not like to say, oh, well, God just did it. That's not, a, that's not an answer, mm -hmm. one, that holds much for me, or two, that will hold much in the world. Is that, does that frighten you, Mom? No, that doesn't frighten me, because I know he'll have the ability to search it out. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't frighten me. But Darwin, as I understand his teaching, maybe I'm wrong, made a direct, direct frontal assault to Genesis 1. And if he is going to say that man evolved from some slimy thing in, in the stream, then I, 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 feel, uh, I feel it's appropriate for me to tell, <coughs> to tell him he's wrong. Because I know, I, I know man didn't. OK? You because, know man did it, and I don't know if man did or didn't. OK, then you're saying that we had one slimy thing and he cre created Adam, and another slimy thing created Eve. And but see, from Adam and Eve, that's such a gross, um, gross simplification this... of evolution. I understand, but that's the most important element. But God's they infusion to... of His self and of His spirit into what do you think, Mom? Into, help, help me out here. Into <laughs> humans was a supernatural thing, no matter how we look at it. Yeah. Whether whether. All of a sudden, you picked up dust, and like the Snickers commercial where you used to have peanuts in your hand, and you get a Snickers bar, whether it was dust and man, and then God says, Yeah. You know, you're, I'm in you. God, so you're saying God created the elephants and the giraffes and, and created man, looked around and said, which one is that do I think is the best to represent my, my, my nature? And he said, oh, it must be man. So we'll make man intelligent and but give, give him the ability to reason see. and to think. I don't know. As I've tried to open up and tried to, to at least catch what is true and what is not true, I want my dad to be open to that too. He's, a, he's a, I wouldn't say stubborn, but he's a firm man. But I wanted him to at least um, consider and have an open mind towards the things that I have an open mind towards, such that I can go ahead and say with freedom the things that I would, would consider a possibility. Well, the only thing I can have a concern about uh, uh, his exploring evolution, as I understand it, is that if Nathan spent his life work trying to explain creation, he would, he would come one step short 
And that's the miraculous element that God introduced that no man can explain. So if his, if his, if his hope and his dream in life is to explain creation, he's going to die a disappointed man because you can't explain the miraculous. He was laying down the line where he would stop, and I was just trying to tell him, I'm not sure I would stop there. I might go, go over the hill, go over the ridge a little bit further to explore and see what God has over there. But back at Wheaton, exploration beyond the limits imposed by parents and pastors can take students to some very disturbing places. Some of the most troubling questions come not just from science, but from the Bible itself. How do we make sense of, of sin coming into this world? If we evolved from apes, did just one day an ape woke up and decided that he had, God said, you're a humans now, and so I'm gonna give you a soul that is responsible to know right from wrong and who my son Jesus Christ will die for after you've populated the whole planet with your little humans. So that, there's that to deal with, and then there's also when you look at some of the family trees that are in the Bible, they all go back to Adam or refer to a descendant of Adam. So we seem to think that Adam was an actual person, and I don't know how to make sense of that. Emi Hayashi is studying to be a veterinarian. She went to a Christian elementary school, but a secular high school. At Wheaton, she is struggling to reconcile their opposing lessons. In high school, they automatically discounted the Bible versus in my Southern Baptist Church, they automatically discounted evolution. So these two line, two paradigms are just completely separated. High school, it was, it was tough, and yet at the same time, I think it made my faith a lot stronger because I was constantly tested on my faith. People expected me to be a Christian. They didn't know what a Christian was. I usually take the defense of evolution only because I get annoyed when I hear a Christian say, well, it has to be six-day creation. There's no other way it can be done. Bible says so. And then, of course, I just flip to the opposite side, and I play the devil's advocate, and that's not necessarily a good thing to do, but I, it's more fun. It's intellectually challenging to be able to think from a point of view that you might not necessarily agree with. If, if you look at the Bible, if you look at Scripture, arguments will... Paul's but for most Wheaton students, this is more than an intellectual challenge. Debates over creation and evolution go to the very heart of their ideas about who they are and why they exist. And no part of Darwin's theory is more troubling for conservative Christians than the claim that we have descended from non-human ancestors and not from Adam and Eve. I don't know. I'm leaning towards the idea that at some certain point in hominid evolution, God gave his spirit to hominids making us human. Because I, I don't believe human, early hominids were human. I believe that we're categorically different and that we do have a soul and we do have a relationship to the creator of the universe. But I mean, I don't know where that happened. I don't know if there was one atom or if it was a group of people. I haven't decided that yet. Well, I was going to disagree with your atom being a group of people. Okay. Oh. <laughs> See, I, I mm -hmm. Theologically, that, Adam, How so? What do you mean? Well, yeah. I think theologically, Adam has to be an individual. Paul basically yeah, flat, I, I says flat out, be, since sin came through one man, and he means Adam, so salvation, redemption comes through one man, Jesus Christ. And so personally, I'm, a, I'm all about, I don't know. Do you think he was, he was like one of a group? Or there was just Depends one? Depends how you uh, interpret man. <laughs> 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 to take the paraphrase of the... At Wheaton today, students are free to argue the possibilities of a literal or an allegorical or a multiple Adam and Eve. But for their professors, open debate on this subject is impossible thanks to the controversy stirred up by one man's remarks almost 40 years ago. At that time, I'd hardly been on the campus of a Christian college before. I had an entirely uh, secular education, but I had been a Christian for a long time. So being on a Christian campus was kind of new to me, and I'm not sure I knew exactly how to behave and probably didn't behave very well. In 1961, at a Wheaton Symposium on Christianity and Human Origins, Walter Hearn told the crowd that the same chemical processes that bring each of us into existence today could have produced Adam and Eve. When the news got out, Wheaton found itself under attack. What had happened is that some reporter for a very conservative uh, Christian paper, which was called The Sword of the Lord, which uh, you can tell from the title of it that it wasn't exactly a, you know, a peacemaking outfit, this guy had been really upset by my remarks or by the style. It is time for all of us to be shocked, thundered the sword of the Lord. Wheaton has swallowed a wholesale dose of evolution, 
by allowing such men as Walter Hearn to express their wild viewpoint on the campus of a Christian college. Untold numbers of Christian people are seriously concerned about Wheaton. Fundamentalists flooded the school with hundreds of protest letters, including one from the mother of a Wheaton student. Twice I have heard that the college is growing liberal, that they teach evolution at Wheaton. What grieves me most is that our daughter may lose her faith at Wheaton. Is this possible? If her faith should be shattered or even shaken, I'd rather see her dead. To reassure concerned alumni and parents, Wheaton ordered every member of the faculty to sign a statement of faith, affirming their belief in mankind's direct descent from two real people named Adam and Eve, who had been created by God. Today, every professor at Wheaton is still required to sign this statement. The reason why, as I understand it, that Wheaton College main, continues to maintain the existence of a historical Adam and Eve in its statement of faith is simply because the existence of those two people occupies a key theological role in everything else that we believe. Evangelical Christians, and indeed all Orthodox Christians, believe that Jesus had to come and sacrifice himself on the cross and then conquer death by rising from the dead. Why did he have to do that? He had to do it because all of humanity was in bondage to universal sin, and then that leads to the question of where did that come from? Well, that in turn came from what Christians have historically believed was a historical fall by two human parents who uh, bore, in a sense, carried along with them, bore with them, uh, the rest of the human race and what happened. And so Adam and Eve, in fact, play a very strategic role in all of the theology of what, of what uh, Christians have historically believed. Forty years after Walter Hearn shook the campus with his shocking remarks, Wheaton is ready to try again. The branching tree of life constructed from the DNA... To help their students take a fresh look at the evidence, Wheaton professors asked Kansas State University geologist Keith Miller, a devout Christian and advocate for the teaching of evolution, to give the keynote address at a symposium on the fossil record and geologic history. So my response was to come to present myself as a strong advocate for the teaching of evolution and for the centrality of evolution as a unifying scientific theory, and at the same time, make very clear my evangelical Christian position. Many uh, evangelical Christians like myself, uh, and historically, again, since the time of Darwin, have seen no necessary conflict between the two. What does a fossil record tell us? Are there transitional forms preserved in the fossil record? And my answer is a resounding yes, lots of them. And, but first we have to know what is a, a transitional form. And I'll go back to Darwin's definition of a transitional form. This is... Uh, Keith Miller's message to these Christian students is that all the evidence, from the ancient fossil record to the latest DNA analysis, compels us to accept the evolutionary theory in full. But for some Wheaton students, the implications of our descent from a common ancestor are still troubling. How you connect um, the Genesis account of man being unique in God's eyes and we're made in the image of God um, with us descending from a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. I think understanding what it means to be made in the image of God is a very, very important question. Um, I personally do not believe that the image of God is connected to our physical appearance um, or our origin as far as how we were brought into being. This is kind of a weird question, but do you think he just um, picked an organism or, and like said, okay, I'm gonna put my soul in him? I think one possibility is that, that God chose Adam and Eve out amongst uh, the other uh, humans that existed at the time and say, I'm going to make you a, a soulful spiritual being in communion with me. Um, I think that's a viable possibility. Thanks. I found it very, very good. I mean, I really, I, th I thought to myself, what a, a freeing thing it is that he would say very unapologetically, 
this is my position. I buy completely into the theory of evolution. This is the way it is. Um, this is the way it's going to be. Just from what I heard from Dr. Miller, I talked it over with my roommate afterwards. And what was refreshing, she and I think a lot alike, so this wasn't terribly surprising. But for us, it was incredibly refreshing to have someone come and blatantly say, I am an evangelical Christian, and I believe in evolution, and to not blink. That was very exciting for both of us. Because I feel that sometimes the professors here may believe that, but they can't openly come out and say, this is what I feel, because it's like coming out of the closet almost <laughs> in our interpretation, because it's, you don't want to do that, because then someone may label you a liberal, you know, God forbid. The symposium may have reassured students like Emmy Hayashi that Christianity and evolution can coexist. But not everyone on campus feels so comfortable with Darwin and his theory. Peter Slayton is an anthropology major, a singer, and, he says, a Texan born in the Bible Belt. For him, the arguments for evolution still aren't strong enough to overcome the convictions he brought with him to Wheaton. At this point, I'm still asking questions. Like, I don't know. If I had to pick a side, I would probably pick young earth creationism just because that's what I grew up with, that's what I'm comfortable with. And so far, nothing in evolution has been able to con convince me, like, soundly that this is the way it happened. One, two, three. The give to yeah. <laughs> Maybe we play the bitch after we're done singing. <laughs> yeah, after we're done singing. One, I think two, what upsets me about the issue is the fact that one way or another, you're called to reinterpret something. Like, if you pick sides, the other side's going to accuse you of either doing bad science or doing bad theology. And, like, either way, it's like a lose-lose situation. You can't really pick sides and do everything right. What bugs me the most is um, students or maybe people who um, don't know a lot about the issues try to threaten me and by saying, if you believe this, you know, you're not really believing the Bible is true or whatever. Beth Steubing, a pre-med student in her final year at Wheaton, is the daughter of missionaries. She grew up in Zambia, surrounded by nature. We live kind of outside of town in a forest, and we just kept all sorts of pets, like chameleons, bush babies, snakes, you name it. So we were always kind of surrounded by nature. And I didn't really grow up with the baggage of, you know, six-day creation is the only way to go. And so from an early age, I was just taught to be open to a lot of different ideas. And I think that was really beneficial. One of the things that I've thought a lot about is just how God works in us. Where is God's place if everything does have a natural cause? And it's been difficult for me, especially being in science, to think about that in an intellectual way. So I was hoping by coming to Wheaton that I could be in a Christian environment where I could think. That re was really, really important to me because I wanted the Bible brought into some of these issues that I thought about in science. That was important to me. But at the same time, I didn't want to have someone open the Bible and say, this is how you will interpret the Bible. We can't have that many idiots out there in science. That's just not possible. So for a Christian to point their finger at a scientist and say you're wrong without having any understanding of what they're talking about is laughable. Just as if a scientist laughs at someone's theology and who's never cracked the Bible at all, again, it's the same thing. You can't do it one way or the other. It's just they have to understand where scientists are coming from. They have to understand this is the data, this is what we have. Now, can you make sense of that with the Bible? Okay, my question for you is uh, how many of you have turned up to be more confused now that you've been at Wheaton than you were when you came? <laughs> okay, well, that's... that's interesting in itself but uh, what does that mean i mean confused in what sense are you going out having lost your faith or it's a struggle it's a struggle in my life to go back and forth where where does god infuse his image in us where does god select us i want that warm fuzzy feeling of god specifically took his hands if he has hands and picked <laughs> up some stuff and put me together whether it's taking my dna and putting the nucleotides together or what i want something like that I think to a certain degree, it's expected that you do believe in six-day creation. I think so. I would almost gather that's the overall theme on this campus, though you're not condemned for believing in evolution. I, there's a distinction, because 
six day creations taught in Sunday school and I'd say 75% of us come from the Sunday school background. So that's all we've learned. And we've been taught by our Sunday school teachers, evolution is bad, evolution is of the devil. So therefore, whatever they say, just don't believe it. For students like Emmy Hayashi, biblical literalism no longer defines their faith. But for Ken Ham, the frequently repeated fundamentalist expression still holds true. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. What, what are these, buddy? You're a dinosaur expert. Okay, that's Triceratops. You don't see many Noah's Ark models with dinosaurs going on the Ark, do you? No, you don't. But but dinosaurs were land animals, and all land animals would have went on the Ark, yeah. so, so it needs to be done. That's so represent Ham on and millions of other conservative Christians are convinced that it is the biblical story, not the evolutionary story, that America's children need to hear. Not just in Sunday school, but in every school. Yes, uh, we are concerned about what's happening in high schools. We're concerned about what's happening in the culture. We're concerned that whole generations of children are coming through an education system basically devoid of the knowledge of God. Ultimately, if you're just a, 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 a mixture of chemicals, what is life all about? Why this sense of hopelessness, this sense of purposelessness? And the reason is because they're given no purpose and meaning in life. If you aren't on the computer tutorial today, at least beginning it and getting a good, a good piece of that done, you're not going to finish it up before the end of the unit. And um, is that all we had to tell him? Yep, that's it. Let's go. Okay, let's go. And if this were something to eat, let me borrow this second job. Claire McKinney, a scientist and Christian in Lafayette, Indiana, is one of thousands of high school science teachers across the country caught in the ongoing struggle between biblical literalism so and evolution. The, the stakes are high for teachers and students alike. Oh. Does she have that sheet? When I was the same age as the students that I now teach, my experience was much the same as theirs, coming from a strong Christian home and active involvement in my church. I did accept that the Bible was the word of God and not to be challenged and i did accept that and then as a teenager when i really started having an increased interest in the sciences and really started looking at the scientific method and what makes science science and they seemed contrary to me mckinney knew that some of her students were feeling these same frustrations over the conflicts between what they had learned in their sunday schools and homes and what they were learning in her class. But she never expected them to take matters into their own hands. She was taken aback when the students circulated a petition demanding that something they call special creation be added to their science curriculum. McKinney and her fellow teachers were even more surprised when over half the students in the school and 35 members of the faculty signed on in support of their cause. When I looked at the paper, um, yesterday morning, the five pictures I saw were outstanding kids that are outstanding students that did very well in this class. And I was really surprised to see some of them sitting in that picture because I thought they understood the difference between science and non-science. And it's fairly obvious to me that if they did at one time, they don't right now. All the teachers, you always hear that we do not accept or reject the existence of God. But when they're accepting biology so freely and saying it's the only way, then, I mean, they might not directly be saying it, but indirectly, that's what they mean. Why are we so afraid about mentioning that there is a God if, in fact, about 80%, <clears throat> I would say, in the world believe there is a God? If you have a religion, and if, unless you're an atheist, which I'm sure is a small minority, then there is a God. You believe, hey, there's a higher being out there. Even and even if you're afraid to admit that, if you're afraid to admit that in class because, ooh, you'd be pressing on someone that there is a God, wouldn't you be just as afraid to press on someone there isn't a God? That, to me, is a scary world. It just shocks me that we could find all this information to su support special creation, mm -hmm. and they say there's none out there. It's like, where are you looking? Because I can, like, give you a book, you know, if you want to know. I don't know if this is an isolated incidence of kids just becoming passionate about the situation, or if this is actually the new creationist game plan. Uh, if you can't, if you can't attack evolution uh, in the Supreme Court, then maybe you can go around and pull one evolution weed at a time to get rid of it. That's what I'm afraid of.
people actually don't understand the issues. People are being told, first, you have to choose between faith and science. You have to choose between especially Christianity and evolution. They're being told, well, it's only fair to give both points of view. It's only fair to uh, teach evolution and balance it with creation science or intelligent design theory or something like that. From their tiny offices in a small northern California town, Eugenie Scott and the staff of the National Center for Science Education deploy an arsenal of weapons to defend the teaching of evolution. Hi, Emily. Hi, Jeannie. Often, the hardest part is just getting people to understand what is and what isn't science. Evolution or science in general can't say anything about whether God did or did not have anything to do with it. All evolution as a science can tell us is what happened. Can't tell us who done it. And as what happened, the evidence is extremely strong that the galaxies evolved, the planets evolved, the sun evolved, and living things on Earth shared common ancestors. You're probably right. At the National Center for Science Education, calls come in from across America from teachers who continue to be accused of locking God out of their classrooms. When Steve Randack called from Lafayette, Indiana, he got the help he wanted. But he was troubled by what he heard. This is Eugenie Scott. Eugenie Scott told me that this is the first time, to her knowledge, that students have taken the initiative. And I am very much concerned that there will be other places where children will step forward, uh, protest, uh, ask school boards to be listened to, and the school boards won't do the right thing. I think they think someone will come out a victor, and I don't believe that that's going to be the case. But win or lose, for McKinney students, this is a battle worth fighting. Tonight, they are taking their petitions to the Lafayette School Board to demand that the members take a public stand for or against special creation. They claim that complex biological structures could not have arisen through natural selection at all but had to have been created by some higher intelligence. According to their teachers, the future of science education at Jefferson High may be riding on the board's response. As a teacher, you feel compelled to, to soothe the distress these kids are having. And so school boards are gonna feel the same thing. Uh, Joyce, we can have a roll call, please. And that sense of fairness is something that school board members have and I think would respond to, and I think it's, I think it's going to be dangerous. Well, I call this meeting to order the Lafayette School Board of Trustees. First of all, welcome. I understand some of you are here tonight to discuss the science curriculum at uh, Jefferson High School, so let me see that show of hands of people that are there for that. Okay, thank you. Let's just move in. Uh, are there any uh, comments from the public? It's now open. All right. One issue that continues to confront American society is that of the teaching of the theories of evolution and special creation in our schools. The assumption of the theory of evolution is that all living things have resulted from chance interactions. The assumption of special creation is that the physical universe and living creatures in it have been fashioned by a supreme being. Please understand that those of us supporting this petition do not advocate the, the banning of teaching of the theory of evolution. However, we believe that the theory of evolution should be taught alongside the alternative theory of special creation. Let us be taught the facts so that we can decide on our own. Thank you. For these students, the argument isn't about science versus the Bible. It's about which views of science will be taught. It is a tactic pioneered in 1961 when a revolutionary book by Henry Morris and John Whitcomb used carefully selected scientific evidence to support the creationist cause. The Genesis Flood is the foundational document for creation science. Everything else has been built upon this book. He makes uh, a number of claims in here that you can somehow find scientific evidence to demonstrate that the Earth was created like a literal reading of Genesis says. The Genesis Flood was an inspiration to creationists. In 1981, Louisiana Senator Bill Keith proposed a law requiring the teaching of creation science wherever evolution was taught. 
Scientific creationism is pure science and is just as unreligious as um, the teaching of evolution science. And also that, um, that it's, it's an abridgment of academic freedom for our school children not to be given all the scientific evidences regarding origins. Over opposition from educators, the Louisiana legislature passed the law. Creation science and evolution became classmates. But in 1987, the Supreme Court ruled that teaching creationism alongside evolution violated the First Amendment separation of church and state. In his opinion for the majority, however, Justice William Brennan wrote that alternatives to evolutionary theory can be taught if they have a scientific basis. What Justice Brennan wrote in the 1987 decision was that, of course, teachers have a right to teach any and all um, uh, scientific views about the origin of humans or any other scientific theory. And that's absolutely true. And what he said was any and all scientific views. Now, of course, one reason why the creationists have worked so hard to try to present their ideas as being scientific is so they can duck under the First Amendment. And I would just like to tell all of you how we want special creation to be taught. And like it's already been stated, we want it taught alongside evolution. I would just like to say that we do not want a religion class or any separate class because it is not religion. So we, we're just begging of you to teach us the facts and let us decide. And that is with evolution and special creation. There's a large part of me that felt, my gosh, we haven't done a very good job with the nature of science if we have this many students who don't understand the difference and why creation and, you know, any supreme being can't be addressed in a science classroom. And I kept thinking, gee, it seems like we try so hard to, to really hit home with what makes a particular event science. And the fact that there seems to be a lack of understanding about that was disturbing to me. What they don't understand is that science is a rather brutal competition of ideas. It is not particularly a, a situation where you get to express your idea just because you want to. That sense of fairness doesn't exist in science. In science, ideas are supported by evidence, and that evidence has to be peer-reviewed, and it has to be repeatable, and it has to be testable, and creationism is not that. And we know that it's our freedom to decide on the information. And we think that it's been neglected by the school system in the state and maybe even in the nation that there are facts we don't have. Thank you. It's real hard for me as a parent and as a teacher to know that not only are they dealing with their own faith issues at a very young age, 14, 15 years old, but they're also dealing with the issues of being disobedient to their parents. And I know that for many of them, it's not only, oh, the evils of evolution, it's that my parents don't even want me to hear about this or listen to it, much less participate in the conversation. I grew up in the church. God created all things. That's the way it was. That's how it ever will be. And I didn't get my first even notion of evolution until like third grade when we were learning about insects. And they're like, well, one day you'll learn that the building blocks of life actually evolved from water. <laughs> and so I went home to my mom and dad, and I was like, we came from water? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's called evolution, and I still didn't understand it. And I guess I had read about it or something, but I just knew that God created us in six days, and I knew he was the creator. And my mom agreed with me on that. My stepdad doesn't, but I don't really know how I learned that. It's just, I probably read it in the Bible. Don't move this. Okay, come on over here and lock it. And I had the same conflicts these kids are having. I mean, I went through that whole growing process myself. And so I can really sympathize. And fortunately, I had a lot of significant people in my life that were willing to sit down and listen to me. I had a very, very intelligent pastor tell me once that I asked him what he thought. And he said, what I think doesn't matter. It's what you think. And he said, here's what I recommend. You learn a lot about both and then you make your own decision. And that's what I did. I went to Bible studies um, and I pursued careers in science and just fell in love with them. 
And I would say that probably by the end of my senior, or maybe I was even in college before I really came to terms with the fact that in my mind and in my heart, there was no conflict. They answer very different questions. They address very different things in our lives. And, and I think they're very, as an individual, for me, they're very supportive of one another. I can't really see that one could exist without the other, at least in my mind. Other comments from the board? Just For over three hours, the students, their supporters, and their detractors struggled over the proposed change in the science curriculum. Finally, the board made its position known. There is well-defined legal and scientific definitions that set out the boundaries for biological science. There are certainly points to be dis to discussed about special creationism, but it does not belong in the, sp in the biological curriculum. We've made it very clear that we are not going to change the biological science curriculum, that if we want to address their intellectual curiosity, it has to be under the umbrella of a humanities topic in some fashion. I want to say thank you so much for coming. I hope you all understand that when we make a decision about our position, we do it because we believe it's our duty. We believe that the law requires us to do what we do and that we, in our meager understanding of science, are trying to do what we think is right. If you have any other questions... The decision preserved the integrity of Jefferson High's science curriculum. But the teachers know this is not the end of the debate. I have yet to hear of a case where they've given equal time in a science classroom. However, I have heard of cases where they've removed evolution from the curriculum. And I don't think the three of us would have continued teaching here had that been the case. I can't speak for them. But I really don't think, as an educator, I could teach biology and do it well if I couldn't talk about the natural processes that make it work. To take that element out would be removing one of the, well, the major pillar that supports that whole field of science. And in good conscience, I couldn't have slighted my kids that way in my classroom. Thy gift to be sins, the gift to be free. Thy gift to be free, the gift to be free. Thy gift to be free. Are we placing students' faith at risk by examining these hard questions? Absolutely. But I would add additionally that there is no such thing as a safe place from which to hide from these issues. If we engage in the most rigid biblical literalism, the fact that our students live in a real world indicates that their faith is always at risk. Christians believe that our faith is rooted in real happenings in a real world. And so to try and structure a place or a way of conceptualizing our faith that insulates us and isolates us from risk is to rob Christianity of its very essence. One problem we have a lot of times is that people just look at Christians and they say, oh, you're just one of those religious fanatics. I don't want to come across as that. I want to be educated. I want to be intelligent. I want to have answers that someone can say, I can respect that. I can respect that. And also be able to argue some answers without God. I mean, that sounds almost sacrilegious, but I, I want to be able to reason some things without, having to bring ne without necessarily having to bring God into the picture. And then I want my life and the way that I live it to reflect God. I don't think science and faith are inevitably in conflict. I am a scientist, I enjoy doing science, and I haven't thrown God out the window at all. I mean, I know a lot of people who live the same way, and because we look for natural causes and things doesn't mean we think that that's all there is. It doesn't mean that we're throwing out the meaning of life. We're just studying what God has made, however he made it, and I don't think those are in conflict at all. When I hear a God-fearing man say, I hold to the evolutionary theory, that was, that was, that was, that worked wonders for me. It, 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 once again, it gave me a little bit of a freedom to say, wow, God is bigger than the box that I may put him in. As his grandmother predicted, Nathan is searching it out. He is finding his own answer to the question, what about God? Charles Darwin's answer came in the mystery of evolution itself. 
In the final edition of his book on the origin of species, Darwin wrote, there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed by a creator into a few forms or into one. From so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful have been and are being evolved. Continue the journey into where we're from and where we're going at the Evolution website. Visit www.pbs.org. The seven-part Evolution box set and the companion book are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424.